All right, guys, today we're going to be taking a look at the Smith & Wesson Model 29 and talking about some of the interesting history that this revolver has. Now, of course, this thing has been safety checked. You guys can see there. Hopefully, there are no rounds in this guy. But today, I wanted to talk about the Model 29 because this gun is pretty infamous. Now, to start off, the 29, of course, is the handgun that was used notoriously by Dirty Harry. And that, I think, is where most people know this revolver from and most people you know think about this revolver when they think about it they think of Clint Eastwood's character and that is certainly true and to be specific the revolver he was using was the 29-2 this one here is a 29-3 you can tell that because you can tell that because of this handy dandy little model number in here. Hopefully you guys can see that. It's really hard to see, but it is in here just behind the crane. So that is where your model number will be. This one in particular is a 29-3. So that means these came out in the early 80s. Um, 82 was the first year for the production of the threes. Now, all of the different models going up to model nine or the 29-9 um, have all of their own unique issues that make them all susceptible to different problems. None of them are perfect, um, but overall they are pretty solid, pretty darn reliable revolvers. Now, when I was doing more research about my 29 and just generally 29s as a whole, Whole, I was actually really surprised to see that this handgun actually had a lot more um, had a different application than what it kind of found itself into now of course like I said it did take the prime time but originally the 29 was designed with two purposes in mind of of course, so this was designed to be the platform for the 44 Magnum because of Elmer Keith's desires to make the 44 Magnum a reality. And so, of course, that was part of the 29's designation. But in addition to that, this was also designed to be a platform for Vietnam soldiers, especially Vietnam soldiers that were working and clearing out tunnels. Um, very infamously, the Viet Cong would use tunnels to move supplies, troops, all kinds kinds of things honestly and so our US troops would be tasked would be tasked um, with clearing out these tunnels to a limited degree and so originally the 29 was actually sent over to Vietnam and saw limited action in a prototype or experimental phase testing and refining this handgun for service in the military field and essentially I think of this kind of as Smith & Wesson was um, with their model 27 very widely used in World War II of course not as widely known or used as the 1911 that was the standard issue handgun at the time but people like um, General Patton used things like the Smith & Wesson 27 and many other troops did especially those who felt more comfortable or competent with a revolver the Smith & Wesson 27 was essentially their their answer for World War II so when it came time for Vietnam uh, Smith & Wesson introduced the model 29 to essentially be the successor of the 27. Now, unfortunately, the 29 just wasn't developed fast enough to really become what the 27 was. And largely, I think that's partly because the 27 already existed when World War II kicked off. And so it just kind of became the standard revolver, whereas the 29 was literally being developed as the Vietnam conflict was happening. So unfortunately, it never saw like official use in Vietnam as a full-on pistol or revolver, but it was tested and used and proven to a limited extent in its prototype or experimental phase as a combat revolver in Vietnam, which I think is really cool. I don't think a lot of people know or talk about that part of the 20 of the 29 and um, I think it's a really awesome part of its history and knowing that kind of lineage that you know these revolvers the 27 the 29 were really designed to be full-on combat revolvers like these were designed to go into war and be used by soldiers so I think that's uh, an interesting thing a lot of people talk about the durability and the track records of Ruger's Red Hawks Black Hawks the Super Red Hawk the Super Black Hawk and there's definitely nothing wrong with those handguns or revolvers specifically um, but 
as far as it goes, as far as actual like warfare and conflict goes, the uh, the 29 has genuinely seen it, and so is the 27. So like these are real actual um, combat revolvers. So in addition to that, I did talk a lot about the 27 and of course the 29. I will say there was a Model 28 out there. Essentially, essentially the Model 28 was never really um, quite as popular as the 27 or the 29, um, but it essentially was also chambered in 357 Magnum and was basically Smith and Wesson's version of a budget alternative to the 27. So the 28 does exist. This just happens to be the 29, at least the 27 are, 29 and 27 are far more popular and there was far more um, use or widespread use of these in, I guess, really more of kind of just lights of just more notable and historical uses of them. Once again, uh, the 28 being kind of more of a budget and actually was offered towards um, police forces because back in the 50s and even up into the 80s and sometimes 90s, the police forces of different um, counties and states were still using revolvers as their primary go-to handguns. And even though that kind of seems crazy because back in the 80s, you know, we had things like the Glock, um, they weren't really standard issue or trusted as well as revolvers. So the 28 really felt that or felt really filled the niche of having a budget 357 Magnum double action revolver. So interesting fact about the 20 set or the 28, it is essentially just a 27, but the 29 really does shine and uh, stands out among its competitors. So, you know, this isn't um, as ruggedly overbuilt as the super Red Hawks um, or even the Red Hawks that originally dropped by Ruger, um, the, the 29 and later what would become the 629 are extremely capable and personally from an experience standpoint, I tend to lean more towards Smith & Wesson's as opposed to Ruger's. I know there are quite, quite a lot of debates on that one where people are like, you know, which side are you? I'm not really uh, too heavily divided or sided, you know. Um, I'll take whatever I have, you know, whatever revolver I'm given in a moment that I need to like defend myself or, you know, use it as a tool. That's the re that's the revolver I'll take. However, I will say as far as the double action on these Smith & Wessons, I do feel like the double action is smoother and slightly lighter. I mean, all double actions are going to be hard to pull. Like you're not going to have a light double action, but from my experience shooting um, Super Red Hawks and um, 629s and 29s, I will say I genuinely find the 629s and 29 end frames just to be smoother shooting. So anyways, that is my kind of rant about the shooting experience on the 629 and 29. Um, I really like them. I think they have a really cool history that a lot of people don't talk about, primarily because film and culture has kind of commandeered the 29 and made it what it is today, which is certainly cool in its own right. But uh, knowing that this thing was originally tested back when it was a prototype pistol um, or revolver back in Vietnam, like it was actually tested in jungle warfare, really adds, I think, a level of cool factor to me um, because that means this thing is actually proven. It has actually seen conflict, unlike, at least officially seen conflict, unlike things like the Red Hawks. So I will say this isn't the most in-depth video, but just sharing some fun facts and things that I found really cool about this revolver. Anyways, guys, as always, God bless and I'm out.